Good afternoon. It's Wednesday, May the, uh, let me see, 6th here in 2020, and this is our midweek Bible study. We're going to continue this through at least probably the month of May, and we may just make it a permanent thing. We've had a pretty good response to this little post we're doing in the middle of the week, continuing our study of the Sermon on the Mount. So um, let me know if you want us to keep it going. It's can, been kind of, uh, kind of fun, actually. So... Uh, but do want you to know, it is Wednesday, May the 6th, Sunday, May the 10th, this coming Sunday, we are having worship here in the sanctuary. If you feel up to it, if you're not too high a risk, if you are uh, ready to, to abide by the guidelines and other things, you know, we, we would love to have you. You know, I know a lot of us, um, elderly, uh, immunosuppressed, uh, there are issues there and you're not quite ready yet. And that is perfectly fine. We're going to continue doing the online and DVDs. They will just be ready a little bit later in the day. They won't be ready in the mornings. Uh, but it'll be Sunday afternoon, late Sunday afternoon before we're able to post things. But Sunday morning, May the 10th, we're going to have our first worship service, 1045 a.m. No Sunday school, no children's church, no nursery. Come with your family, sit in a group with your family. Uh, we recommend you wear a mask. We... Um, uh, we're going to wipe the surfaces down. Yes, we're going to sterilize the best we can. Uh, offering plates will be spread out around the sanctuary so you can give um, without really having to handle the plate itself or anybody else. So hopefully that eases your mind a bit. But yes, we're going to worship the Lord come Sunday. And uh, those of you that prefer not to attend, we are going to have the DVDs ready. We are going to post on YouTube and the church uh, website. We want you to be included, all right? We're all part of this at, at Travis Baptist Church. And uh, also, the day before that, May the 9th, this coming Saturday, we're going to have a work day, men, out on the playground. we got some shrubs and tree limbs to trim. We need weed eaters for trimming the around the edges of the grass and the playground equipment. Um, I'm going to have some Roundup for you to spray on the weeds. And uh, so we do need some, some help Saturday. We're going to have someone with a trailer here to haul the branches off. So we'll have something for you to do. Need to bring your own equipment. We need trimmers, loppers, chainsaws, pole saws, uh, weed eaters, line trimmers, all that kind of stuff. And uh, probably even a blower or two would be helpful. So uh, come and join us for that. It's going to be 8 o'clock Saturday morning. Should be done by noon. And that is this week. If you're worried about social distancing, well, we're going to be outside. And this ought to keep you all from gathering around talking. Just get busy and you won't be up around anybody's face. All right. So come and join us on Saturday. And uh, uh, hopefully we're going to be starting to gradually get back into the swing of things over the next month or two. So come and join us Sunday, May the 10th. Matthew chapter 7. We are in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapters 5 through 7. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is teaching us how to live. We come to chapter 7 today. We're going to do just one verse today. We will pick up the rest of this little section next week. But for today, um, probably what we can now call in the days, our current days, the most misused verse in the Bible. Probably up until about, oh, the advent of social media, uh, and still to an extent, the, the, the passage on I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me in Philippians chapter 4. Uh, probably one of the misused verses by athletes and others who figure every time they dominate a situation, they've done it through, you know, hitting a home run, scoring a touchdown to making a million dollars. Um, but now I think we would say the most misused verse in the Bible is here in Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Matthew chapter 7 verse 1 says, and this is Jesus speaking, Judge not that you be not judged. Let's pray. We love you, Lord. Teach us your words. Teach us what you intend us to understand. Teach us that we cannot just throw things out the window and assume that we can do however we want. We have seen in the past when people do whatever they want and what's right in their own eyes, the disaster that follows. We're praying, God, that this will not be the case in our lives. We love you and we seek you and we want to grow close to you. And we say these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. All right. 
Judge not that you be not judged. Why is this a misused verse in the Bible? Um, I mentioned with the advent of social media, the misuse of this verse has grown. A few years ago, a uh, person came onto Facebook and basically made the statement, and this is the, the, the paraphrase of it, but it catches what her meaning was. You guys can't judge us. We're happy together. So what if he's still married to someone else? We're happy and you have no right to judge us. Okay, think about that for a minute. He's still married to girl number one. Girl number two is thrilled to have him now. And she's telling everybody, don't judge me because I'm openly committing adultery. Uh, I'm announcing that I'm committing adultery. And uh, you have no right to call it adultery. Well, you know, even though she's pretty much the textbook case for it, um, this attitude of don't judge me. Listen, we use this as the biggest excuse because when we're saying don't judge me, what we are really trying to say is I will do what I want to. In the book of Judges, Israel kept falling into lots of sin and lots of trouble. And two summary statements is basically the same statement appears twice towards the end of the book. Uh, and basically says this is the root of their problem and the verse goes like this and again it's stated twice the exact same way it says and every man did that which was right in his own eyes when we do that which is right to us when we become the sole judge of right and wrong disaster tends to follow when you think that being involved with a married person and helping tear that family apart uh, what no matter how shaky or how troubled that marriage was that's adultery, God says it's wrong. You can justify it all you want to, but it's wrong. And it's not just that case. We, we do it with nearly everything. You know, uh, the, the guy who gets a DWI, the guy who, who overdoses, the, the, the violent person. You know, we all just come back with, don't judge me. And we use these words of Jesus right here. Jesus said, don't judge anybody. We get the tattoo. I don't have it, but you know, some people do. The tattoo of only God can judge me. And that sounds religious, but it's really defiant. Because what Jesus is saying here is not that you can do whatever you want till you stand before me on judgment day. What he is saying here has more to do with a few things uh, along this line. I want you to think for a minute. In John chapter 8. And this kind of goes right in line when they say, look at Jesus. He never judged anyone. And here's the example they use. In John chapter 8, they caught a woman in the act of adultery. What happened to the man? I don't know. I am guessing he ran faster and got away. The religious leaders drug this lady to Jesus, toss her down before them and, and tell him, now doesn't the law say she used to be stoned to death? What do you think we ought to do? Because she committed adultery. And... Uh, Jesus says, yep, she did. And let he that is among you without sin, let him cast the first stone. He that's without sin can throw the first stone at her if you want to stone her to death. And they all dropped their rocks and slowly walked away. We use that verse, say, see there, you, you can't judge me because you know what? She was in adultery, but their sins are just as bad. They couldn't judge her. But that's not quite the point of that story. I mean, in one sense, yeah, they were sinners also. They were not qualified to judge her as such. But Jesus sure was. Because he did judge her. People say, no, he didn't. He let her off the hook. No, he didn't let her off the hook. Jesus didn't judge her. What he said to her was, go and sin no more. He judged her actions as sin. He called her basically a sinner. He would anger most of you folks out there that are saying, don't judge me. Jesus judged her. What he did not do is condemn her. What he did not do was execute her. Perhaps because he is Jesus Christ, the all-knowing God, he could see into her heart. He knew she was repentant, shamed, embarrassed, and broken. And in that moment, while he had the right to condemn with his judgment. He chose to extend mercy. Mercy conditioned upon. Go and sin no more. Stop this. Don't do it anymore. See. 
When he says judge not lest you also be judged, really the emphasis there could be more on the act of the condemnation of it. We can look at the way someone speaks, the way someone acts, the way someone treats people, and pretty well tell, yeah, you know what, you're doing wrong there, that's sin. They might scream back, don't judge me. Well, you know, but you're, 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 you're in the wrong, but don't judge me. Well, let's think for a minute. Number one, uh, when we go to people and what Jesus is speaking about here is not so much that I'm perfect and you're not. Because if we go down in the passage that we'll look at next week, it talks about, you know, before you go knocking someone down, better take a look at yourself. Now, Jesus could judge that woman caught in adultery because, yes, he is perfect and sinless. You and I may not be perfect and sinless, but we also know bad when we see it. But again, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7, of which this is a part, is all about your attitude on the inside. So as he says, don't judge, what does he mean? I think the first thing he's telling us as we see somebody else in the wrong, let us be aware whether we have a critical or hypocritical spirit. By critical, I mean, y'all get around people who like to really point out faults. And I have pastored churches for, boy, probably 35 years now, since I was ordained anyway, 1985, that's a long time ago. Uh, and many's the time um, having to deal with people caught up in their sin. Uh, many's the time having to deal with members who like to point out the sins of others. Some people are so good that you would think that, that in those lists in 1 Corinthians and Romans about spiritual gifts, you would think these people had the spiritual gift of criticism. Uh, of knocking others down. You know, I got people that think their main job is to, in the church is to come in and point out what's wrong, what's not clean enough, what's not right enough, what's not good enough. And, you know, they're never part of the solution. But they really like to point out the problems. Now, when we do that relationally in treating other people, is that all we do is point out their problems, point out their weakness, point out where they're wrong, where they're, you know, back in the day, long ago, when I use the word hypocrisy, we sing, oh, how he loves you and me and hated our brothers. Going back to slave owning days, going back to Jim Crow days, for us to claim that Jesus loves the little children and us not to love all of them. That was hypocritical. That's judgmental. This is what he's warning against. It's about taking a look at yourself <coughs> and deciding, am I being overly critical? Am I being overly harsh? Am I not extending mercy to others? So first, beware of your, your own critical spirit, your own hypocrisy. Um, yeah, it's bad for her to be caught up in adultery. But what if I go home and mistreat my spouse, ignore my children? Don't take care of my responsibilities. Maybe my sins are a little bit easier to cover up, and I'm not silly enough to go posting them on Facebook, but I got a beam in my eye while pointing out the moat in someone else's. That's a phrase Jesus uses later in this passage to refer to, you know, you got a two by four hanging out your head, and somebody else has a little bit of sawdust, but you're hammering on them. Be aware of your critical spirit. A second thing I think Jesus is trying to tell us here in Judge Not is be aware of generalizations. By generalizations, you know, those people, they're all like that. They do that. It's typical of them. You know, sometimes us boomers, us grumpy old folks, we look at these younger inner generations and we use words like snowflakes. We use words like, you know, they all need safe spaces. And maybe there's some of them out there and we see that happening. But I'll tell you what, I've met a lot of young people. I mean, by young people, I'm meaning under 25, I mean, 15 years old to 30 years old. Very young. Um, man, they're as responsible as can be. They may be in the minority, I don't know. But it seems to me I run into more of them than I do of the, the prototypical snowflake. Um, Many people in Generation Z are struggling and trying. They've grown up with school shootings. They've grown up with a lack of safety and security in their lives. 
they grow up looking at the way housing prices and other things have shot through the roof with a lot of doubts as whether, you know, the typical three bedroom, two bath home is going to be a reality for them. But they grind along anyway. That's commendable. I mean, in, in their lifetime, they have faced a lot of things that a lot of us didn't. Um, the fact that anything they did could automatically be made known to the whole world through Facebook. There's, there's a, a big deal about bullying and stuff. What, what we're talking about here, though, is, is generalization. How, how just because a generation or a group of people or a race of people may have some common characteristics, there may be some that get more press than others, uh, doesn't mean they're all bad. Let's face it, us Baptists, how many bad apples do we have among us that have given us a bad name? And we hate it when people lump all, you know, I like lawyer jokes. I like preacher jokes. And, uh, but you know, there comes a point where, you know, it, we're not all really like that. But we make the generalizations. And I think that's part of what Jesus is warning about. Realize everyone's an individual. Give everyone that chance before you pre-conceive, before you prejudge. Well, I've known people like that before and they're all like this. Just like their daddy, just like the rest of those folks. You cannot do that. That is what Jesus is speaking of. The third thing he may be applying this is, is that you and I need to be wise and not assuming motives. I don't know why you did what you did. You're there in the grocery store and you see a mother scolding her child, maybe slapping him on the back of his hand or on his bottom and, you know, we don't like to see that in public. But you and I don't know what was going on. Is she abusive? Or is she just fed up with a little bit of a strong-willed child? You know, sometimes that slap sounds a lot louder than it hurts. I'm not condoning child abuse or anything like that. I'm saying sometimes we walk in on the middle of a situation and we don't know how it started. We don't know what's been going on. And, and before we say she's a bad mom and give her that glare... Do you know what she went through today? Do you know how much pressure's on her? You know, some of us through this quarantine thing and, and loss of jobs and stuff, man, we're about to burst. And it's just gonna take one tiny pinprick to make the whole balloon go off. Well, be careful when assuming something. You know, that person comes into church grumpy, they got an attitude, they were argumentative. Do you know what happened before they got here? Before we judge, don't assume we know their motives. And, and another area, this would be the fourth one. We're talking about, don't, you know, be aware of your own critical spirit and hypocrisy. That was number one. Be, be careful of making generalizations. Third one was be wise and not assuming motives. And then the fourth one here is, is understand that you can't judge their level of ability. As a pastor, and I say, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. I usually do some introductory remarks, giving people time to find Matthew chapter 7. Inevitably, I am 15 minutes in the sermon, and somebody's still turning pages back there because they don't know where Matthew is. Now, do we go, oh, you must not read your Bible much. You don't know where Matthew is. Or, is it entirely possible they're just a new Christian? They're trying to learn their way around the Bible. Big secret here from Pastor David. Your Bible has a table of contents. Don't be afraid to use it. Um, it's up there in the front of the Bible, just like all table of contents. So when you hear that book of the Bible, if you understand what they said, and I understand like Nehemiah may be hard to find just because how do you spell Nehemiah? But when we say John, you should be able to go to the front of your Bible, look at the table of contents. Anyway, don't judge people because they may not be a mature Christian as you. They may not know the word as well as you. I mean, many times I've taught like teenagers, these kids have been in church all their life. And I'm saying, all right, what does John three sixteen say? And they all blankly stare at you. Seriously, 10 years in church, y'all don't know what John 3.16 says? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Then they finished the verse for you. They knew what it said. They were just being, you know, sulky teenagers. I, I, I can't judge their ability. But we can't judge their ability, their maturity level. Um, just like, you know, you can't expect a toddler to be able to install a ceiling fan uh, sometimes a person may just not have the moral experience. They may not have the, the strength, the maturity to do. And so in those cases, we shouldn't judge. And finally, uh, we want to remember this. And uh, you can judge when you know right from wrong. 
God has taught us that there are some things acceptable, not acceptable. We need to be discerning. In fact, the rest of this passage, as we'll get into next week, finishes up with, yes, you, you know what's right and what's wrong. And uh, this, this judge not never means to excuse sinful actions. But it does mean to check yourself. Check yourself for being overly critical and even hypocritical. Check yourself for generalizing people. And just lumping everyone and not treating them as, a, as an individual. It's also about, you know, understand that some people may not be there yet. Um, it's not so much uh, that they're trying to do wrong. They just haven't learned. Uh, or maybe they have other issues. Again, uh, this goes back to where uh, we can't, uh, our other point, assume their motives. We don't know. And, you know, it's the old thing of maybe the guy was stealing just because he had nothing to eat. Um, now, the Bible does say you ought to find a job. But, you know, right now, in these kind of times, people get desperate. And uh, so we're, we're not so much saying it's okay to steal. What we are saying is sometimes we just don't know why people do what they do. And that's why we're not judging comes in. Now, blatant, defiant, adultery, violence, abuse... Defiance of God, rejecting what is good, embracing what is evil. You know, the Bible clearly lays out their sins and we can see that and know it. But we also remember something Jesus also said in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. So there is a time, as Jesus did with that woman in adultery, to extend mercy when we could have condemned him. May God bless you this week as you pray and as you learn to walk with him. Real quickly, let's go, go to the Lord. Thank you, God, for your love for us and the mercy you extend to us. Bless those who have listened, strengthen their hearts, and help us, Lord, to live a life glorifying you. In the name of Christ, we say it. Amen.